Good afternoon. At this point, I think most of you have taken a lecture, the first lecture exam, or you will some point this evening. Uh, so once you get that over with, uh, we'll need to move ahead and start looking at the rest of Chapter 5, which deals with connective tissue and a little bit about wound healing. I am going to break this PowerPoint into two different videos because it is sort of long, 110 slides. So I'll try to do half of it uh, in this session and make uh, the other half uh, Wednesday. So let's get started with this. So we're again, we're still in Chapter 5. We're dealing with histology. But now we're turning uh, to connective tissue. A lot of this you've already had in lab, so a lot of it should be very familiar to you, but of course there will be some extra details in lecture that you'll need to know. So overview of connective tissue, it really is very diverse. Uh, there are many different types of connective tissues that have a wide, very wide uh, variety of functions. Uh, it's much more diverse compared to epithelial tissue. And as it says here, it is the most abundant type of tissue. Remember that wherever you find epithelial tissue, you find connective tissue deep to that. So that's part of the reason why it is so abundant. And it really has a completely different structure uh, or layout compared to epithelial tissue. Um, cells will actually occupy a uh, matrix, and we'll, we'll talk about what that matrix is and what, what it's made of. Uh, but cells will sort of be embedded within this background matrix. And unlike epithelial tissue, connective tissue cells are not directly in contact with each other. They're more loose or free. Now, as far as vascularity, so this will be an important thing to know. I'm sure you'll have a question about, about this uh, regarding which connective tissues and which kind of tissues in general are vascular and which are not vascular. And the reason that's important to know is because that has to do with wound healing. It has to do with, well, if you have an injury to a, a certain tissue, is it going to heal pretty easily or is it not going to heal easily? So uh, you should be aware of what tissues are vascular and which are not vascular, and we'll certainly mention it as we go. Functions of connective tissue. Again, there will be a lot of different functions. Uh, part, they will serve to connect organs. For example, tendons and ligaments connect structures together, right? Tendons connect muscle to bone and ligaments connect bone to bone. And you probably already remember that dense regular connective tissue is what makes up tendons and ligaments. And so there's a reason why that connective tissue is structured the way it is because of this function of having to build a tight connection between structures. Support, all right, we'll, we'll see that bones, all right, bone tissue is actually classified as a type of connective tissue. So we'll see that. And then there's cartilage, right? We'll, we'll look at cartilage as well. You have not looked at cartilage yet in lab, but you will, I think, later in lab seven, I believe. All right, but we will go ahead and talk about cartilage in this lecture. Protection, well, yeah. Your, the cranium, which encases the brain, your ribs and sternum, which uh, are to the anterior of the heart and lungs, you know, help serve a protective role to those really important vital organs. All right. And again, remember bone, and we'll mention this, bone is actually a type of connective tissue. Immune protection. There, is a, there are a lot of different kinds of white blood cells that you find embedded in the matrix of connective tissue. So, so connective tissue plays a big immune role. Assistant movement, of course, bones, again, bone is a type of connective tissue. Storage, so fat is uh, stored in adipocytes, and you already know that adipose is a type of connective tissue. And then storage of other uh, substances like calcium and phosphorus are going to be stored in bone. Heat production, okay, so uh, this has to do with adipose specifically in what's known as brown fat, which you only find in infants, and we'll mention that too. Transport. So guess what? Blood is actually classified as a type of connective tissue also. And of course, blood plays the role of transporting substances. So you can see that connective tissue has a really uh, diverse set of functions. 
The next couple slides are uh, just from a table that's not in your textbook, but I included it because I thought it would serve as a good study guide for you because it summarizes all of the connective tissues, the types of cells that you find in each of these, uh, and you know what some of the general features and functions are of these connective tissues. So I think this that's uh, serves as a good study guide for you. And same here with this uh, again with that table. <clears throat> so common characteristics of connective tissue. You might remember from uh, the first part of chapter four, we talked about embryonic origins, and we mentioned that. Uh, there's uh, basically you're like a tube when you're an embryo and you're made of these three layers called ectoderm, endoderm, mesoderm. And you might remember that connective tissue is derived from mesoderm. Now mesoderm actually evolves into what's known as mesenchyme. And this is a really interesting uh, point uh, here I'm going to bring up. So yeah, let me just mention it now. <coughs> Excuse me. So, connective tissue, like I said, comes from mesoderm. Now, mesoderm is really the embryonic term, right, for this substance. When you're an adult, we, we call it mesenchyme. And you should know that mesenchyme makes up part of bones. Okay, so you find mesenchyme in, inside of bones throughout your entire life. Now, what's significant about that is that connective tissue can continues to be synthesized within this mesenchyme that you find stored in your, in your bones. Specifically, it's the red bone marrow in the bones where you find this mesenchyme. So throughout life, you're able to make new connective tissue, most of it, from this mesenchyme. And I'd like to mention something to you. Uh, the cell type that you find in this mesenchyme, they're called mesenchymal stem cells. Really important. Stem cells, okay, so there are these stem cells that you retain throughout life that are here existing in this mesenchyme in your, bone, your red bone marrow. Now, why, why am I talking about it? Because it's clinically, very clinically important. You all remember, uh, most of you probably remember, um, years ago, uh, there was a big controversy about stem cells, right? It became this big political ordeal. Uh, you know, it went, one side believed you should use stem cells uh, to, to cure diseases and, and find treatments for, for diseases. And another side believed, did not believe in using stem cells. Well, I'm here to tell you that, well, stem cells actually used to be my specialty when I worked as a neuroscientist at the Tulane University Gene Therapy Center. We worked with all three kinds of stem cells. We worked with embryonic stem cells, fetal stem cells, and what are known as mesenchymal stem cells. Some people call mesenchymal stem cells adult stem cells because these stem cells you retain these as an adult well so here's the idea we worked with all three types of stem cells and what we found in my in the lab i was in was that the mesenchymal stem cells were very similar to the embryonic and fetal stem cells in in that you could gear them to become any kind of cell that you wanted to all right, so this takes me to a, a clinical trial that we did where let's say somebody got into a car accident or some sort of traumatic event. They go to the hospital and let's say it is determined that maybe their, their spine, if their spinal cord has been damaged, for example, that maybe they, they're going to be paralyzed, that, that the, the damage to the spinal cord was so severe, they're going to be paralyzed. Well, the doctors would ask this person if they were willing to be part of a research study that we were doing at that time. Most of them said yes, because the, you know, the idea of being able to walk again was pretty, uh, pretty desirable. So anyway, the surgeon would go in and take mesenchymal stem cells from the person's bone marrow, give the cells to us, 
we would culture them up and cause these mesenchymal stem cells to become neurons. We were able to cause these cells to turn into neurons. We cultured those cells up, we gave the cells back to the neurosurgeon, and the neurosurgeon injected those new neurons right back into the spinal cord. Now you had to do this within a short time period, like three to five days for it to be optimal. But guess what happened? The people were no longer paralyzed. Full recovery of function with these cells. So, you know, at that time, it was really, really remarkable. And basically, you know, the use of these mesenchymal stem cells eliminates any kind of moral controversy because, you know, we're dealing with adult stem cells that are being taken from that, that person's own body. All right? They're not fetal. They're not embryonic. There, there's no moral controversy at all. So these are the future. And that's why I'm telling you this story uh, because there are actually um, – certain clinics in Lexington and all over the world that are now employing the use of this technique. All right. It takes a long time for research to get to the public. I mean, you know, I was doing this um, like what, 10, 12 years ago. And back then it was pretty much un unheard of. So, but guess what? Now it's, it's getting more and more accepted. And more and more clinicians are starting to utilize this treatment. Uh, in particular, uh, the, the clinics and hospitals in Lexington are mainly using it in orthopedics. So uh, if a person has uh, like a, a bad meniscus in the knee, for example, um, what, or a uh, intervertebral disc. So plenty of people are getting total uh, replacement of their intervertebral discs in their spinal cord and structures in the knee, like the, the menisci of the knee. Basically, just use the same procedure I just told you about. It's actually pretty simple. And, you know, inject those new cells into that area, and guess what? You get a brand new meniscus or a brand new intervertebral disc. It really, really is awesome. And, you know, I think that in the future, more and more doctors are going to get on board with this because it's just been so successful. Uh, you know, you get, like, a brand new structure here. All right. And you know, what's great about it, too, is these cells come from your own body. They're not coming from somebody else. So, you know, you're also eliminating the problem of immune rejection, right? If you inject somebody else's cells into your body, the immune system is going to go wild. You know, it's going to recognize those as non-self cells. Those are cells from foreign cells. But since you're taking them from your own bone marrow, there's no immune system rejection. So it really is fabulous. So look for this in the future, all right? the use of these mesenchymal stem cells. All right, that was my tangent. I swear that is the only tangent I will do for this session. <laughs> All right, um, so like I mentioned before, connective tissue is going to have varying degrees of vascularity. All right, so for example, cartilage. Cartilage is avascular, it does not have a blood supply. Whereas something like bone, bone is very highly vascular. There is a lot of there are a lot of blood vessels in bone. You have a very high supply of bone, uh, uh, sorry, vessels in bone. And so make sense of that for a second here, right? So if something is avascular, right, it doesn't have a blood supply. So what that means is that it's going to be difficult for that tissue to heal if it gets damaged. This is why cartilage, if you have a cartilage tear or, or something, um, you know, you're not going to, it's not going to heal on its own. Chances are extremely low that it will heal on its own, which relates back to this mesenchymal stem cell uh, situation, right? Which is why they're able to use these MSCs to replace cartilage that's been damaged, right? Cartilage is not going to grow back on its own. Now, go to the other end. Bone. Bone is highly vascular, right? So this is why bone heals easily. If you break a bone, guess what? You're going to heal from it because there are a lot of blood vessels there that are able to transport and deliver all of the nutrition and healing uh, chemicals that are needed to restore that tissue back. Okay, so bone is, you know, going to be able to heal. All right, so the main idea is relate this concept, relate, you know, the level of vascularity to 
whether or not that tissue is going to be able to heal easily or not. So uh, also previously I mentioned that the cells of connective tissue are sort of embedded in this matrix. We call it an extracellular matrix or ECM. Okay, and so this matrix is made of a bunch of different things and it's going to help uh, give integrity and support uh, and strength to the tissue. What are we going to find in our um, connective tissue? Well, really three main elements you're going to find. Ground substance, which is the same thing as matrix. Okay, so basically you can say matrix and ground substance interchangeably. Fibers, and you already know the fibers that we find. Collagen, elastic, and reticular fibers. And then we have cells, all right? And there are a variety of cells, and we're going to talk about each one of those each one of the real like main cells that you find there. Okay, so again, the ground substance. Ground substance is like a gel-like material, all right, that's, like I said, going to sort of uh, support cells um, and, and the fibers. So this slide has to do with the details of what you can find in this ground substance or what you can find in that matrix. Um, so probably you'll have like one question from this slide. I, I, you know, I don't want to get too detailed with this stuff because we could. All right, but uh, just be familiar with uh, the three classes. Okay, the three classes of protein <coughs> that that you're going to find pretty commonly in this uh, matrix of connective tissue. The first one is glycosaminoglycans. That's always a fun word to say. You can just abbreviate it as GAGs. Um, and these are long polysaccharides composed of, you know, uh, these aminos and stuff. Don't worry about that, okay? What, worry about what its role is, okay? So glycosaminoglycans function to help regulate water and electro ba electrolyte balance in the connective tissue. Now, a real popular type of uh, glycosaminoglycan is something called chondroitin sulfate. All right, this is the most abundant kind of glycosaminoglycan that you find in connective tissue. And you've probably seen this word before, all right, chondroitin sulfate. And this helps provide stiffness to cartilage, for example. Now, there are other, there are other types of GAGs, heparin and hyaluronic acid, but we're not going to talk about this. I'm just concerned that you know this chondroitin sulfate. Uh, the next class is proteoglycans. Proteoglycans are sort of like... Um, sort of a uh, adhesive uh, class of molecules they're, they're going to help hold the tissue together they serve like a, a sort of like a glue all right so again really just a supportive role that this proteoglycan plays and then you have other adhesive glycoproteins which there are many different kinds and and really they're going to serve a similar role that the proteoglycans do all right and helping to sort of help hold and bind the tissue together all right um, now, you know, you may notice, like, if you go to buy some supplements, let's say some joint supplements, let's say your knees are irritating you and, or, or you know, uh, maybe that you've had a lot of wear and tear, maybe you played sports, maybe you played soccer or something, and you have a lot of wear and tear on your joints. Um, you know, um, it may be helpful to take these joint supplements that you find over the counter, but uh, these are the things you want to look for. Read the label and see what's in it, right? Um, if it has glycosaminoglycans in it, that's good, all right? Such as chondroitin sulfate, okay? Um, you know, because again, it's going to help restore or maintain. I don't know about restore. There's some controversy about that. But it can help maintain what structure is still intact. It can help, help keep uh, the healthy cartilage healthy, basically, all right, because, you know, it contributes to the integrity of the connective tissue there in your joints. You already know this. The three types of fibers that you find in connective tissue, remember that. You know your three fibers. If you know them, you know that you know more about the function of the tissue, all right? Uh, so a lot of the stuff I'm, I'm not going to really go over again too much because you should already know it. You should already know this. All right, so I'm not even going to review it. As far as what kind of cells you will find in connective tissue, you should know that we have 
uh, cells that end in the word blast, uh, or we have cells that end in the word site. And so let's make a distinction between those, okay? So if you see a word that ends in blast, like fibroblast, chondroblast, osteoblast, what you should know is that this is a, basically a developmental cell. What that means is it's either young, it's either a developing cell, it's not mature yet, okay? It's an early or immature form of a cell, which eventually will mature and turn into a site, okay? So, for example, chondroblast. Chondroblast is an immature, early, or young form of a cell that will eventually turn into a mature form and at that point be called a chondrocyte. Okay. Now, another thing about these blast cells is that not all of them will mature. So, for example, fibroblast. Fibroblast is an example of a cell that sometimes it will mature. But most of the time, it, it's going to remain as a fibroblast. It will always be a fibroblast. And the reason for that is because blast cells synthesize something. They're make, they make something. And you know already from lab, uh, fibroblasts make collagen. All right, so we're going to retain our, our fibroblasts in their form of fibroblasts for life because we need to continue to make collagen throughout life. Okay, so fibroblasts, you know, we're going to retain those. <clears throat> now, chondroblasts, though, for example, totally different. That word chondro means cartilage. Whenever you see the word chondro, it means cartilage. So chondroblast is different because chondroblast, yes, is going to be found in early, uh, it, it's an early form of a cell that you find in cartilage. But you don't retain these very much throughout life. What happens is as you grow older, you actually lose more of these, okay? Chondroblasts do eventually turn into chondrocytes. Chondroblasts will uh, turn into their mature form and become chondrocytes. Once they are chondrocytes, they cannot make or secrete anything in the cartilage. All right, they're mature. And this is also another reason why cartilage is difficult to heal because we, we are not keeping our chondroblasts throughout life. Osteoblasts, we're going to talk about osteoblasts later, very important cell found in bone. Osteo means bone. All right, now you do have stem cells that says hematopoietic stem cells in bone marrow. So in your bone marrow, you have stem cells, okay? These, and hema means blood. So basically you have stem cells that are always making red blood cells, and that happens throughout life. So let's talk more about some of the cells that you find in connective tissue. Adipocytes, which you know are the type of cells that you find in adipose. And you should remember the function, all right? Adipocytes are going to store nutrients. They're going to store triglycerides. Hence, they store potential energy, right? Because these triglycerides uh, can be broken down, all right? And when we break those chemical bonds in the triglycerides, we get energy from that. Leukocytes, all right, are white blood cells. Now, there are different kinds. I'm not going to ask you uh, about any of the different kinds of leukocytes. You can do that in Bio 139. Uh, for now, just know that we have these leukocytes, which are, are white blood cells, same thing. And, of course, they're going to play a role in response to injury. Mast cells. Now, mast cells are a pretty interesting cell. We find these all throughout connective tissue. Now, you should understand that these mast cells, uh, they actually have a variety of functions, similar but different functions. The most important thing here that you all should know about mast cells is, well, mast cells secrete histamine, and definitely for the rest of your life as future clinicians, you should know that histamine 
is released as a part of the inflammatory response. Okay, so um, part of what causes the inflammatory response is just this, is that the mast cell secretes histamine, all right? And histamine, what is the purpose of it for inflammation? The purpose of it is to dilate blood vessels. So the dilation of blood vessels near the site of the injury is part of the inflammatory response. Right? You all know that inflammation is marked by um, swelling, right? And redness. So part of what causes that, or actually not part of, what does cause that swelling and the redness that you see with inflammation is the fact that the blood vessels in that area are dilating. They're dilating. And this dilation is caused by histamine. Now think for a second, why would we need to dilate our blood vessels around the site of injury? Why do we want to see that? Why is it actually good to see an inflammatory response following an injury? Okay, it's good to see your immune system's working. That means your mast cells are secreting histamine and your blood vessels are dilating. Why do we want our blood vessels to dilate there? Because we want to increase the potential amount of blood volume to that area. We're making our blood vessels bigger so that we can accommodate for the flow of increased blood. Why? Because we want to bring an increased number of white blood cells. We want to increase uh, the amount of chemicals and other substances that, that can make it to that injured area. All right. <clears throat> so definitely you want to make that connection there. All right. So excuse me. And it's very important as, uh, to cause that inflammatory response, okay, to dilate those blood vessels. Now, distinguish this from something else because I, I, I want to make sure you're all clear on this. You have, when you've had a cold, right, let's say you're sneezing, coughing, whatever, you got like a head cold. Um, or let's say, uh, you, you know, you're, you have some allergy to something. What do you do? You go to the store and you buy what are known as antihistamines. Okay, so let's clarify something. <clears throat> Those products are, are targeting different, different histamine receptors. Antihistamines over the counter that you use for um, allergies, it's not targeting the same histamine receptor that you see that's operating here with inflammation. Okay, histamine is capable of stimulating a wide variety of receptors. Histamine has uh, a lot of uh, receptor subtypes. So you might have H1, H2, H3, for example. You don't have to know that. You don't have to know that. But that histamine can act at, at a number of different receptors. And the action on each one of those different receptors has a different function. It has a different effect. Okay? So the antihistamines that you buy in the store are not influencing the same receptor that, that, that would cause blood vessel dilation or affect inflammation. It's a different histamine receptor, okay? Okay, uh, histamine can be secreted from mast cells for the reason of causing inflammation if there's urine, or mast cells can secrete a different form of histamine that acts on a different receptor for a different purpose, and that purpose would be um, as an anti-allergen. Okay, so just throwing that out there. All right. Okay, what else? Mast cells also secrete a chemical called heparin, which helps inhibit blood clotting. All right. So once you've formed a blood clot, once that's done, you need to stop it. So mast cells will also secrete heparin to stop the blood clotting process so it doesn't get out of control. Okay, so yeah, mast cell, very interesting cell. Macrophages, we've mentioned before, these are phagocytic cells. They do phagocytosis. That means they engulf things. They're going to engulf microorganisms. They're going to engulf debris. They're going to engulf dead cells, whatever, all right, part of the immune system. So all of these you find in connective tissue. Here is just an illustration of all the different cell types and everything that you, and fibers that you can find in connective tissue. And notice that all of this 
is sort of laying on top of or embedded within the um, background substance, right? The background, the extracellular matrix. All right, so the next series of slides are really just going to be review. So I'm hoping I can fly through these because you really already know this stuff because you did it for lab. All right, so the, we're going to talk again about the types of connective tissue, what they look, you know, structure, got to know structure, got to know function, got to know location with all of these, just like with epithelial tissue. Okay, so there are two classes of, of what are, what's known as connective tissue proper, connective tissue proper. You have loose connective tissue and you have dense connective tissue. All right, I, I'm not so, I'm really not concerned that you know that classification. My concern is that you know for areolar, adipose, reticular, dense regular, dense irregular, elastic, that you know the structure, function, location. Right, areolar. Okay, again, I'm not going to go into too much detail because we've already done this. It is the most common. Uh, it's going to support and bind things. Contains fibroblasts. Of course, remember anything where you have collagen fibers, you're going to find fibroblasts because fibroblasts make and secrete collagen. It's the only one that has all three fiber types in it: collagen, elastic, reticular. Uh, here's a picture. Now, again, uh, a lot of these are not from your book, but I, I like them so much. I do want to include them because it gives you everything you need um, that, that you might be tested on. You have a picture of it. It's giving you a description, like what's in there. It's giving you the function. It's giving you a location. Uh, just another picture, again, of areolar tissue and, uh, you know, again, location and all that. Remember that. Areolar connective tissue is the one that you always find to all epithelial tissue. This is the one. When we say connective tissue is deep to epithelial tissue, it specifically is areolar connective tissue. And you should definitely know that, all right, that this is the type that underlies all epithelia. More pictures of areolar connective tissue. Reticular. So reticular connective tissue, of course has reticular fibers, that's why it's called reticular connective tissue. Now, instead of fibroblasts, well, they are like fibroblasts, okay, but, but we call them reticular cells, okay. Um, reticular cells are going to make and secrete the reticulars. And you remember, these are highly associated with lymphoid organs, um, and, you know, that this tissue is going to function to help form networks, uh, a supportive environment, uh, a stroma-like uh, or mesh-like um, support system. Okay, and again, here's a picture of it and all the information about it. Another picture of it. Remember how these tissues carry in appearance. All right, you really want to look at like what stands out, what is consistent amongst all of them. And you can see here that the little reticular fibers, remember that reticular fibers are going to be short and branching. They're going to branch. And you can see how these reticular fibers form little compartments. Okay, they form compartments. Another picture of reticular. Adipose. So I want to distinguish here the difference between white fat and brown fat. So white fat is the fat that we have been talking about, um, you know, in lab, all right? Out of white fat. White fat is uh, what you find in adults, okay? All of us have this. Remember, it serves to store nutrients. The cells are called adipocytes. You should know that white fat is vascular. It's pretty, it's very highly vascular, right? You do have a lot of blood uh, circulation there. And then your functions of adipose, right? Cushioning, shock absorption, insulation. Remember, this does play a role in body temperature regulation, energy storage. Now, what's the difference between white fat and brown fat? So you probably will have a question on this. The difference is, well, brown fat is the kind that you find in babies. You do not see brown fat in adults. It's in babies. A lot of people call it baby fat. So over time, you know, babies lose this. Brown fat will, be, will go away. 
okay? The brown fat will be converted into white fat. Now, why is it called brown? It's called brown because it's very highly vascular. It actually does have a brown color to it because of all of the blood vessels in it. <coughs> now, think about why this, why does a baby need this? Well, a baby, what brain region controls body temperature regulation? I'm hoping you're all just saying it in your head right now. Hypothalamus. Remember the hypothalamus. All right, regulates body temperature. Well, in a baby, the brain is not developed very well at all yet. In fact, the brain is still developing up until the age of 25. So keep that in mind. All right, the brain does not stop developing until about the age of 25. Well, anyway, so here's the deal. The baby does not have a, its hypothalamus is not developed enough yet to perform the function of body temperature regulation. So it's going to be the job of brown fat to heat the bloodstream. Okay, because with all this blood, now remember blood, you know, carries heat in it. Okay, so that's why we're going to have all these vessels um, all throughout, you know, this, this brown fat. Okay, so that's the difference between the two. Picture of adipose. More about adipose again, just being repetitive there and giving you different pictures. Same again. All right, so the next, we've got dense connective tissues. Dense regular, very, very strong tissue. It's going to withstand high tension and stretching. Okay, you find it in tendons and ligaments. Now, take note. Okay, dense regular connective tissue is very poorly vascularized. That should tell you right away. That's why if you have an injury to a tendon or a ligament, it may not ever heal. If it does heal, it will never be back the way it was 100%. It will never be like it was originally. It will never be as strong, all right, and it can take a long time. Okay, because it's poorly vascularized. And then remember about the structure of this, you know, what tells you that it's dense regular. Uh, you know, the collagen fibers are running in a parallel fashion, all right? And, and so this is going to help resist pulling um, in, in different directions. It can only really uh, pull in one direction. Picture of it. Un more pictures of it. Now, sometimes these do look wavy, all right? Don't confuse this with elastic connective tissue, all right? Dense regular can have sort of an appearance, a uh, wavy appearance to it. There it is again. You can see your little, uh, these little dark, uh, like oval type structures here. Those are your fibroblasts. Remember, wherever you find lots of collagen, you're going to find a lot of fibroblasts too because the fibroblasts are making that collagen. Dense irregular, so it's kind of like dense regular because it has it is dense with collagen, but the fibers are irregularly arranged. They're not in a parallel fat, uh, arrangement, and you know there is a purpose for that. All right, the, this this means that wherever this is, that tissue is able to resist tension in many directions. Uh, you find this in a few different places. Main place I care that you know is in the dermis, because we're definitely going to talk about this stuff again when we talk about the integumentary system. So yeah, you find um, dense irregular in the dermis of the skin. So right now you should be summarizing in your brains all the tissues you can find in the skin. So let, let me just uh, recap that for a second. As far as epithelial tissue, you have stratified squamous epithelial tissue that makes up the epidermis of the skin. Deep to that, you have your dermis. First of all, what connective tissue is deep to all epithelial tissue? Areolar. So you find areolar tissue in the dermis, 
you also find dense irregular connective tissue in the dermis. What about the hypodermis? Hypodermis is made of adipose. So look at all the different tissues you can find in the skin. Picture of dense irregular, notice that the fibers are all arranged and, you know, there's no real organization to it. They're just haphazardly arranged. More pictures of dense irregular. More pictures of dense irregular. Elastic. Elastic connective tissue is pretty easy to get. <clears throat> now, you find this in the, uh, lining the walls of your large arteries. You can also find it in uh, ligaments that are connecting vertebrae. Okay, so your vertebrae uh, in your vertebral column, right? You know that your, your spinal column is very flexible, but very strong. So you're going to have this elasticity component there. Note that you also find this in bronchial tubes. And that has some significance uh, later on in uh, Bio 139. You're studying the respiratory system. When you talk about uh, illnesses such as emphysema, all right, there are two types of emphysema. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, you'll learn about that later. I won't get into the details of that. But basically, uh, you know, you have this elastic connective tissue in the bronchial tubes. And what happens in emphysema, for example, is that you know, you're going to have a problem with this elastic connective tissue. You lose it. So if you're not having this elastic tissue, it's going to affect the ability to exhale. All right. You're going to have a hard time exhaling. Anyway, you do note that you do find this in bronchial tubes. Picture of it. Lots and lots of wavy elastic fibers. Again, okay, so cartilage. We haven't talked about cartilage in lab, but let's go ahead and, and do that now. Okay, so cartilage is another type of connective tissue. You should know um, the cells that, that are in this, all right? You have uh, already mentioned chondroblasts. Chondroblasts are present during growth and development. And the chondroblasts actually make and secrete the surrounding matrix of cartilage. But eventually, the majority of your chondroblasts are going to mature. They're going to mature into chondrocytes. Okay? And so this is the type of cartilage cell that you find in adult cartilage. Okay? And again, relate this to why, especially as an adult, cartilage you cannot heal it will not heal on its own very well at all and that's because we don't really have i mean it's partly because we don't really have these chondroblasts anymore all right so we're not able to make any new matrix if we have an injury there so chondrocytes are kind of unique because chondrocytes actually exist in these little cavities these little protective cavities and these are called lacunae Lacunae is plural. If you take that E off and say lacuna, that is singular. So the thing is, you know, because we lose our chondroblasts and, and they just turn into chondrocytes, well, think about that. If you don't have any more chondroblasts, are you going to be able to make any more chondrocytes? No, because chondroblasts become chondrocytes. Make sense? Okay. So the idea here is that what chondrocytes we do have, we need to protect them. All right, really need to be protected. So these chondrocytes are going to be surrounded by this cavity called a lacuna in order to help protect uh, what chondrocytes we do have. Cartilage is made very much of water. Uh, it is also made of collagen and <clears throat> uh, some of these other uh, items we've already mentioned, all right, chondroitin sulfate and hyaluronic acid. Now, there is a uh, lack of nerve supply to the cartilage as well, okay? Now, to the very outer membranes that surround cartilage, there is innervation, but the cartilage itself does not actually have a nerve supply. Remember, cartilage is avascular, avascular. Again, another reason why this tissue does not heal on its own. I mean, there can be some healing, but it's not great. 
Now, there's something that surrounds, there's a membrane that surrounds cartilage. It's called perichondrium, all right? Peri meaning around. So there's this membrane around cartilage. Now, that membrane uh, does contain some blood vessels, okay? So we are able to get some nutrition to the cartilage by way of the perichondrium. But again, it's not going to be a lot. There are three types of cartilage, three. We've got to know them, okay? For lecture, we need to know structure, function, location. For lab, you will also need to know the same things. All right, so let's go through them. Hyaline, hyaline cartilage is the most abundant kind of cartilage, and it really kind of has like a shiny appearance when you see it on a slide. It should look a little bit shiny. Where do we find it? Definitely need to know locations here. So at the ends of your long bones, so your long bones are like the, your, your limbs, okay? So the femur, tibia, fibula, humerus, radius, ulna, your long bones, that's what you need to know for now, the ends. And it makes sense that you find this there at the ends because what this, car, what this cartilage does is it, it provides a smooth surface, all right? <clears throat> a smooth surface um, so that your long bones, it, where, they're, where the joints are, okay, so where the long bones connect to each other, so that there's an ease of movement between those two bones, okay? So this hyaline cartilage gives a smooth um, uh, substance there at the ends of the bones. You also find it in the nose, the trachea, the larynx, the cartilage of the ribs. Elastic cartilage, elastic, don't confuse this with elastic connective tissue, okay? Don't confuse those. You have elastic connective tissue and you have elastic cartilage. Even though cartilage is a type of connective tissue, don't confuse them. So why is it called elastic? because it does have elastic fibers in it. And you should know that this is found in the ears and the epiglottis. The epiglottis is a really interesting structure. Epiglottis. Uh, I'm pretty sure I'm gonna be bringing that structure up again just because it's a pretty cool structure. It's basically like a, in the back of your <clears throat> throat you have, uh, or I should say, uh, between uh, like the larynx and the trachea, you have this little structure. It's like a little flap. It's called the epiglottis. And what this flap does is it, it, it's part of the swallowing response, okay? So when you're eating or drinking, the epiglottis moves on top of the trachea. It will cover the trachea. Think about it. You have two tubes back there. You've got an esophagus, which leads to the digestive system. You've got a trachea right behind it. The trachea is going to lead to the respiratory system, right? So you, when you're eating and drinking, do you want your food and water to go down to the lungs? No. You want it to go to the digestive system, you want it to be diverted to the esophagus, not the trachea. So the epiglottis, as part of the swallowing response, will cover the trachea, preventing food and drink from getting into the lungs and instead be diverted to the esophagus. So it's a really uh, um, uh, underappreciated structure. And you've all had this go wrong Sometimes maybe that reflex, the swallowing reflex doesn't work perfectly. And sometimes, like let's say you, you, you uh, are eating and you laugh at the same time. What happens? Food ends up coming out of your nose. <laughs> okay. That's because, hey, that epiglottis maybe didn't cover the trachea all the way. Kind of when you start coughing, you have like a, a very violent coughing fit. Okay, or it can go up through your nasal cavity. Okay, anyway, we all have to appreciate that epiglottis. It is made of elastic cartilage. It has to be elastic, right, to be able to, you know, move over that uh, 
uh, trachea. Fibrocartilage is the third one. This is the strongest kind of cartilage, fibrocartilage. It is just full of collagen. And you're going to find this in, in intervertebral discs. Okay? So the discs that separate uh, the different vertebrae uh, really need something strong there. And the knee. You find the fibrocartilage making up the menisci of the knee. Pictures. So cartilage. Okay, notice. So in cartilage, remember, when you see the word chondro, that means cartilage. So yes, we're going to see chondrocytes sitting in their little lacunae. Remember, remember, look, chondrocytes have to be protected, so they're going to be protected by these little cavities. Okay. Uh, the little dark spots, uh, you can consider those the chondrocytes themselves. And what's outside of them, like the little white areas, or, you know, like the, the white areas, yeah, the, the chondrocytes sitting in, okay, that's actually the lacuna. All right. And a lot of times these chondrocytes in their lacunae sort of group together. They'll, they'll like group together in pairs. A lot of times they're like pair. Um, or it might be like three or four. Okay, they sort of like exist as a group there. And then everything, you know, there's nothing else going on here, right? That's all you see really. Chondrocytes and lacunae, and you see your um your extracellular matrix back back there. Okay. Now you do have collagen. Take note that collagen is there, but you just really can't make it out. Okay, you can't make it out by sight. Okay, what does it serve to do? Okay, it's going to be like a and remember I said it serves uh um, as a ease of movement sort of structure between ends of long bones. It serves to support and reinforce. And remember where we're going to find this. Now, I didn't mention it on the last slide, but you should definitely know another important location for is the embryonic skeleton. Okay? The embryonic skeleton is not ossified yet, meaning it is not bone tissue yet. All right. That's why babies, okay, you got to be real careful with them. All right. Because their bones aren't fully born yet. Now, embryos have pretty much pure cartilage instead of bone. But once once the baby's born, that cartilage starts to become bone. All right. The cartilage in the baby becomes bone. All bone comes from cartilage, and we're going to see how that works when we talk about bone physiology. Okay, but for now, just note, uh, yeah, the embryonic skeleton is made of this hyaline cartilage. More pictures of this again. Okay, so just check those out. And again, this is all repetitive about function and location. More pictures of it. The next cartilage is elastic cartilage. So with this, just like hyaline cartilage, you also see chondrocytes sitting in lacunae. Okay. Um, they are going to appear a little bit larger here in elastic cartilage. Okay. But you can still see there's a chondrocyte, and it's in this surrounding lacuna. Now, how can you tell the difference between this and hyaline cartilage? Well, remember, this is called elastic cartilage, so that tells you there are elastic fibers in it. And you can see those little fibers. Look at all the little dark lines here, right? Those are, you can see them all in the background, right? Those are elastic fibers. Go back to hyaline real quick. Notice there are no, you can't see any fibers there, okay? There are no elastic fibers there at all. Okay, so that's the difference. All right, remember where you find it. All right, the external part of the ear, epiglottis. And really it helps to maintain shape of something while also allowing great flexibility. More elastic cartilage. The last type of cartilage is fibrocartilage. So again, this is the strongest kind of cartilage that you have, the strongest kind. It is cartilage, so that means it will have chondrocytes, and they're going to be sitting in these little lacunae, color and fibrocartilage. Okay, and the reason for that is that 
you know, this tissue, it, it, because, uh, you know, it has so much collagen in it, all right, all these little blue fibers, I mean, it is jam-packed with collagen. It has to be because it is the strongest. Remember, collagen has the function of providing strength, okay? So, yeah, it's just loaded up with collagen, all right? Um, very strong. And where do you find it? Intervertebral discs, discs of the knee, and also a very important place called the pubic symphysis. So basically your pelvic bone, so you have a right pelvic bone and a left pelvic bone. And at the anterior, these bones join together by way of the pubic symphysis. Okay, so that tells you this cartilage is really, really strong. Uh, now, this is another picture of it, but honestly, I really don't like it. Um, you, you know, your textbook has some weird pictures in there sometimes. And, um, you know, this is not how you're going to see it, okay? If you see fibrocartilage, it's going to look a lot more like, like this. Okay, but again, do you know your functions and locations for this? All right, more fibrocartilage. Look again, look at all that collagen there. Okay, so remember, again, reiterating this, cartilage is avascular. This is why healing is very slow if it even happens at all. Okay, it may not happen at all. Remember the other reason why cartilage is slow to heal? You should definitely remember the other reason. And the other reason, remember, is because we lose chondroblasts over a lifetime. Okay, so the older you get, the fewer chondroblasts you have. That means the older you get, if you do get a, a damage to cartilage, you're much less likely to recover from it because you don't have chondroblasts. And chondroblasts are what make the matrix. Chondroblasts also are what mature into chondrocytes. So if you lose chondroblasts, you're not doing either one of those things, right? Okay, so there are two reasons really why cartilage is is either not going to heal or if it does it's going to heal slow and this really does depend on age all right um you know if you're a younger person i don't know let's say you're 10 or maybe or even like 15 years old you know if you have a cartilage injury you're you're more likely to heal okay because you still have chondroblasts but again if you're like you know i'd say beyond like 30 years old uh you know you're just steadily losing these um, chondro chondroblasts. Okay. Another issue, okay, with cartilage is that later in life, all right, now you remember that I mentioned that cartilage turns into bone. Okay, so during development, so when we're developing from, from, from childhood through adolescence to early adulthood, cartilage becomes bone. And that's good. That's what you want to happen to build your skeleton. All bone starts out as ca cartilage, all of it. Okay, but once our bones are fully formed, once they have fully, uh, you know, uh, calcified, basically, um, you can get this problem where cartilage will still, over a lifetime, do this calcification process or ossification process. Basically, ossification means a tissue is turning into bone. Uh, when you say calcification, it means calcium is being deposited into that tissue. Okay, so cartilage, remember, is the preempt to own. So a problem can arise later in life that, that some of your cartilage can actually continue to undergo this and, and become bony. All right, so that, that can be a problem in old, old age. Okay, I do want to quickly get through just a little bit about bone, and then I'll I'll stop this lecture. All right. Now, uh, you know, really with, with bone, um, there's so much to it, and I'd really like to save most of this for the bone chapter when we actually talk about bone physiology. So now let's just focus on the basics. Okay, so bone is a type of connective tissue. It's also known as osseous tissue if you see it put that way. You already know the structure of bone because you know the structure or the function of the uh, skeletal system to support and protect body structures because uh, cavities are made of bone and they help protect organs and then support 
Now we do get storage of all kinds of things in bone. We can store fat. Now remember, fat can be stored in adipose, but we can also get fat stored in our bones. Okay, there's something called yellow bone marrow uh, that we store our fat in. Okay, now in red bone marrow, you store, or this is where you actually make your red blood cells. I think I have this on a slide somewhere else, but basically in bone you have yellow bone marrow and you have red bone marrow. In yellow bone marrow, you store fat. In red bone marrow, this is where you're synthesizing new blood cells. And also, what else do we find in red bone marrow? Mesenchymal stem cells. Remember the adult stem cells I mentioned. All right, what else? Calcium. Okay, so calcium is a major storage site. Or I'm sorry, so that backwards. Bone, all right, is a major storage site for calcium. And we'll see why that's so important and the huge relationship between bone and calcium. All right, really important in physiology to know that. So we'll talk about it in uh, the bone chapter. Cell types, you have osteoblasts and you have ocytes. Osteoblasts, again, it's a blast cell, so it's going to synthesize something. Osteoblasts make and produce the matrix of bone. Osteocytes are the mature version of this, um, and they also play a role in maintaining the matrix. Um, osteocytes, like chondrocytes, reside in lacunae. Now, we're really going to go into detail later about these cell types, and there's really a lot more going on with these cells. Okay. Now, just to make a connection with wound healing, osteoblasts, okay, remember how I mentioned chondroblasts, all right, chondroblasts, the ones that you find in cartilage, we lose those over time, right? Well, in bone, we do not lose osteoblasts. All right, make a connection there. So in bone, we're always having osteoblasts throughout life. Okay, again, make a connection there. So why is it so easy for bone to heal? One of the reasons is because we continue to have plenty of these osteoblasts throughout life. So if we get an injury to bone, we are able to produce more matrix if we have injury there. All right. Make sense of that. Another reason bone is so good at healing is because unlike cartilage, it's very vascular, right? Okay, make those connections there between, you know, why a certain tissue is able to heal, whereas another one is not, all right? It's due to the structure. Remember, structure and function. Uh, something, so bone tissue is arranged in these little units called osteons. All right, uh, we'll mention that later. Um, only thing on the slide, it looks like a lot, but it's really not, okay? Uh, basically, there are two forms of bone tissue. You have spongy bone and compact bone, all right? What's the difference? Spongy bone is just what it sounds like. It has like this porous appearance. And you should know that the spongy bone, like where is it? It's really on the inside of bones, okay? It's like in the middle, okay? It's in the middle of bones. Um, and you also find spongy bone at the ends of long bones. All right? And so spongy bone is made of these little uh, networks called trabeculae. And then there's compact bone. Compact bone is much more dense. It is not porous. It's just all the way ossified tissue, and uh, you really find this on the outer part of the bone, the outer part. That's really all you need to know with spongy versus compact. Here's a picture of bone, and uh, you know, you should hope that you get a picture of this in lab that you have to identify because it's really easy to identify, all right? You have like these tree trunk looking structures. One tree trunk looking structure is actually called an osteon. All right, and you'll notice there are a few osteons, okay? Um, now, <laughs> I'm not going to detail everything out here. Uh, we'll do that when we do uh, the bone chapter, okay? But right now, all you should be able to do is like, okay, 
what does bone tissue look like as a whole? All right. Um, and that's good. Uh, some pictures of spongy, spongy bone. Now, again, we're going to see like these abeculae. You will not be asked to identify um, trabeculae. Okay, you will not be asked to identify spongy bone on a slide. All right, this is just to show you kind of like how we have this porous appearance to spongy bone. And it's compact bone, again, that's going to be made of these osteons, these units. All right, the osteons are highlighted in blue here. All right. And again, when we do the bone chapter, we're going to break down the osteon into its individual structures. There are like at least five or so different structures inside an osteon that you'll need to know about. Again, picture of compact bone. Uh, let me go back for a second. Okay, so note that in these osteons, you have these big dark circles right in the middle. Okay, that's called the central canal. Okay, so every osteon has a central canal. And it's through this central canal that all of our blood vessels and nerves are traveling through. Okay, so this should give an idea of, well, gosh, look how many central canals there are, right? That, that gives an indication of how many, just how much, you know, uh, vascularity we have in our bones, all right? So have a large nerve supply running through there. Um, Yeah, you know what? There's not much here to blood, so let me finish that up, and I promise I'll stop. So guess what? Blood is a type of connective tissue, all right? It is considered an atypical kind of, blood, of connective tissue because it is fluid, right? You have red, red blood cells. Um, you should know that red blood cells are called erythrocytes. You should know that red blood cells, what they do, they transport oxygen and carbon dioxide. Okay, what other cells do you find? Leukocytes, right? We're always going, well, sometimes, <laughs> depending. Going to have white blood cells uh, being, you know, transported through the blood, which have an immune system role. Again, here are your different kinds of leukocytes, but I will not be asking you the names of the different kinds of leukocytes. Now, the last thing that you find in, as part of blood are something known as platelets. A lot of people think platelets are cells, but you should know they're not cells. They're actually fragments or pieces of cells. Okay, they're not cells. Okay, they're little pieces of cells um, that are associated with blood clotting. Okay, um, that's all we really need with blood. Here's a picture of blood. Um, mostly what you're seeing here are erythrocytes. Uh, the larger ones that look completely different, those are going to be leukocytes or white blood cells. Um, again, don't worry about telling the difference between the different white blood cells. Another picture of blood. Okay, but again, you notice white blood cells look completely different compared to the red blood cells. Another picture. So that's it. I'll stop there, and uh, we will finish the rest of this uh, soon. Wednesday, I should have the next one up. All right. Thank you very much. I hope you all have a great day or evening.